All right, at this point in the course, we've seen some accounts of laws of nature. Um, the claim all laws of nature are is just regularity that we observe in the world. They just describe the world. And there's nothing about them that necessitates the world being in any way, um, which if you're into uh, sort of austerity, or you don't want to sort of posit more mysterious things right in the universe than you need to. This seems to be an attractive view. Um, but there are several problems with this account that some claim make it untenable. Um, two people uh, that have argued against regularity accounts and then have their own accounts um, that do claim something stronger, some libertarian theories laws of theory, laws of nature um, do necessitate, right, things happening, um, are Armstrong and Dretzky. Um, this piece that you read was from Armstrong offering some objections, and then the next will be Dretzky's positive account of libertarianism. So why might we need to give up on regularity theory? So first, let's uh, sort of state what regularity theory is. Here is Armstrong's account. Um, and according to his version of what he calls naive regularity theory. Now, this is naive because um, this version is not, is going to have some problems that people, you know, have then sort of revised the theory to capture those problems. So let's start with the basic statement, look at the problems, right? And we may or may not get into some of the subsequent revisions and so on because the argument goes on for forever. Um, but naive regularity theory is this. Um, so P, P here is just any statement. Right? Um, so P is a statement of a law of nature. Remember, we've had the distinction between laws of nature and sort of sentences that describe them, right? Laws of nature are supposed to be things in the world, not just sentences. P is going to be a statement of a law of nature, if and only if, number one, P is universally quantified, so it's got to um, be something that applies to everything, right? Not just, it's not going to be talking about particular people or particular objects. So laws of nature need to be general. Um, number two, uh, it needs to be true, right? And true in a way for all time and everywhere, right? Can't be just a local law at a particular time. It can be a law of nature needs to be contingent. So this is to distinguish it from um, mathematical statements like two plus two equals four, right? That's necessarily true. All bachelors are unmarried. That's necessarily true, right? As, as long as bachelors means what bachelor means, um, it's never gonna be false. Um, whereas laws of nature are gonna be contingent. So again, my true example, if the acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, um, there's nothing necessarily contradictory in supposing that it might be a different number. Um, so it's contingently true. Perhaps that number could have been different. Certainly there would be some other um, effects of that, and it could be really problematic if it was a different number. But um, uh, anyways, it's going to be different. And four, um, P contains only non-local empirical predicates, apart from sort of the logical connectors and quantifiers and stuff like that. Um, so that one may sound a little confusing. What do we mean by non-local? We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so what do we get from these conditions? Um, what we get is that any true non-local generalization about matters of fact will be a law, right? And this comes again from the austerity of regularity theory. It's not saying that it's anything more Law of nature is nothing more than just describing generalities in nature. So that means, well, any true generality should count as a law of nature. Um, so if it happens to be the case that all swans are white, it's probably a law of nature that all swans are white. Um, and notice, right, there's nothing about this law that's explaining the fact that all swans are white. That's not telling us anything about the genetics of swans. Um, the law just is the observed right. What is this issue of um, local versus non-local? Um, and so this isn't quite out of the same um, condition that uh, Armstrong is saying naive regularity theory does have. Okay, so here's the reason we want to, and I, this is before, right? 
reason to say we don't want local predicates in our laws of nature is that we don't want it to be a law of nature that everyone in this room is shorter than six foot four, right? Um, maybe true, right? Um, for all we know, it, it could end up being true for all time, right? There may be rooms that no one over six foot four has ever entered, right? But that's just going to be an accident, right? Um, there's nothing about the structure of the universe right, that should entail that no one over six foot four can ever enter the, the room. Right? So, what we want to do is rule out sort of just accidental things that happen to be locally true at a particular time or something like that. Laws of nature throughout the universe, um, and they need to uh, say more. Than, they need to describe sort of general truth, not the truth that happens to be the case in any particular place. Um, so it can be tricky sort of to draw this line, right? So um, so living in Australia, right? So it can't be a law of nature that all um, creatures living in Australia uh, can tolerate heat above 105 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, right? That might be true, right? Um, and it might be even true for interesting reasons, but um, we don't want to have general laws of nature that only talk about Australia. But that's not to say that a law of nature can't talk about properties, right? Spatial relations, right? So. Um, being one light second distant um, from a particular proton, that's no good, right? Because again, it's picking at a particular object. It's not in general. But being one light second from some proton, that's perfectly fine. There might be things that you want to say about the behavior of particles that are that close to the proton that would hold the universe. Right? So again, the idea with these non-local predicates is we want very general laws. We don't want laws that only hold for particular places or particular times. Okay, so now we've uh, laid this out, um, this condition about non-local um, predicates. Here's an, here's an objection. The problem is, even if you rule those out, you can still um, formulate a law that only applies to like one person or one object. And intuitively, this is not what we want out of scientific laws, right? So um, take this law, right? this is general, again, by law, According to the regularity theory, I just mean a generalization right, that meets those criteria. Um, so I could say all faculty members taller than six foot four of a university philosophy department that offers philosophy of science in the first of two summer sessions, but it has not offered it in at least two years that contains, right, that has more than 10,000 students, but less than 100,000 students, and so on, right? I could keep adding conditions that in themselves are totally general, right? They're not. Um, the predicate itself is not referring to any particular person or any particular department, but if you pack enough of them together, you can get a general statement that one particular person, in one particular um, university, right? So I could probably, right, if I kept this going, um, I'm getting pretty close to just picking out Rick Grush, who is the tallest member of our philosophy department. Right? Um, and I can do all that using totally general predicates, not ever mentioning his name, not ever mentioning UCSD, and so on. Um, that being the case, then if I want to, that's sort of my, um, the antecedent of sort of my conditional. So for all X, if they are, have all these predicates, right? Um, then if I want to say like, uh, they will typically wake up after 11 a.m. or some other thing that happens to be true of Rick Rush, um, then it will turn out that it is a law of nature, right? That all this stuff, right, all the tallest faculty members of philosophy departments that so and so will typically wake up after 11 a.m. Um, according to naive regularity theory, that would count as a law of nature. The problem, and it is true, the problem is it's only made true by one particular guy. And the fact that he wakes up after 11 a.m. may have nothing to do with the fact that he's tall and so on, right? Um, so this seems to be an inadequacy in regularity count is that I can cook up a law of nature um, that fits all the criteria, but it's only made true to one particular guy and the way he sort of behaves. Right? Um, so this seems to suggest that regularity theory is not 
as stated, right, by Armstrong here, naive regularity theory, it's just not sufficient for bringing out only laws of nature, right? We need to say more, we need more conditions. Um, and maybe you can add conditions to regularity theory to, to save them, right? Or maybe you just need to scrap regularity theory all together. Either way, we got a problem. And also it's, the issue is it's not just local properties that are the problem. Um, need from laws is properties that carve nature points. Very popular term, right? And it means like, it seems like there are natural divisions of nature. Of like what are the properties that are really important for the interact causal interactions of things that can explain how the universe works. Um, atomic weight probably is one of these important properties that does carve nature at its joints. Um, being a faculty member of a philosophy department that's taller than six foot four, probably isn't. There's probably not very many interesting generalizations that we can make about people to satisfy those predicates. Um, but so intuitively, that's something we want to capture in our account of laws of nature, right? Um, but what how do we formalize that, right? How do we formulate the idea that we want the important properties? We want the ones that carve nature in its joints. Um, can we find this more rigorously? Um, we will see on uh, Wednesday, the David Lewis paper, he, he does some attempt um, to do this, right? By his account of what he calls natural properties. Um, and he's gonna try to save regularity theory by making this distinction in a better way. Um, unfortunately, there are other problems with regularity theory as well. So let's look at some of those. So again, right, regularities are just statements of what happens to be the case, or what is, um, and it does, it is the case, that, you know, there are no gold spheres with a volume of greater than one cubic mile. Certainly on Earth, there aren't any. Um, the problem is, and according to regularity theory, that is actually a law of nature. No sphere of gold will be, for, for all x, if it's a sphere of gold, then x not greater than one mile in diameter, right? Um, but you might want to say, well, I, this is not an impossibility, right? It's odd to say that's a law of nature that that could never happen. Um, you know, if we get a hole together, certainly you could create one such sphere. Um, so it's strange that that should end up being a law of nature according to regularity theory, right? Whereas, and to, to sort of point out how strange it is, you, you contrast this with the law it says there's going to be no spheres of uranium-235 with a volume greater than one cubic mile. Now that does seem like it should be a law of nature because um, if you pile up that much uranium-235, you're going to get an explosion, right? Long before you ever got one that was a mile in diameter. Um, so we should be able to make a distinguish, distinction between the first kind of law about spheres of gold and the second kind of law about spheres of uranium, and yet um, regularity theory can't make that distinction because it only cares about what happens. If it doesn't happen, then it's not a law. Right? And it's a law that it can't happen, basically. Is what it's asking. Right, so there's, as I said, there's lots of things that haven't happened, right? But you don't want your laws of nature to say it's never happened. It's just kind of, again, accidental that they haven't happened yet. Um, so you might say the law of nature that all ravens are black. Um, and maybe even if it was the case that there weren't any, I think there actually are Albano ravens, but say, okay, say it was the case that really now on earth all ravens are black. Again, you don't want that to be a law of nature because really according to evolution, I could make an obvious way of how you could get a bunch of white ravens, right? Move them to the North Pole and over the generations they will evolve and they will probably evolve white feathers, right? So again, if it happens to be the case, you don't want it to be a law of nature that it can never be the case. Again, just for another example of sort of the same whole um, problem for regularity theory. And this also extends, this problem extends to non-existent subjects. Um, right, so regularities, they have this logical form, which we've been through a few times, so hopefully you're starting to feel comfortable with this sort of logical form. For all x, if it's an f, then it's a g, right? So for all x, if it's a raven, then it's black. If it's a swan, then it's white. If it's an object, then it accelerates towards the Earth at 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and just because it, 
it's a law of logic that statements like that will be true if the antecedent is false. If there are no f's, right? Um, so the statement for all x, if x is a raven, then it's black, um, would actually be true if there is no such thing as raven, right? That's just sort of uh, again, this isn't a logic course. But just believe me that that's sort of a, a result of the way the logical statements are. And the problem for regularity theory then, it appears to turn out to be a law of nature that all centaurs are good at philosophy, right? Because there are no centaurs. Basically any law that has centaurs in the F position, um, anything in the G position, and it will come out true, right? Um, intuitively that should be wrong, right? We don't want it to be a law of nature that all centaurs are good at philosophy. Um, worse, it, it also ends up being a law that all centaurs are good at philosophy, right? Again, um, anytime the antecedent is false, right, when there are no centaurs, you can say anything you want about them and it'll turn out true according to this, um, this fact about logic. So you end up with contradictory laws on the regularity theory and that seems bad too. Um, and in fact, actually important, right? It's not just about centaurs. We do want to be able to make laws about things that don't exist because we want to be able to predict, right? We want to be able to um, know what will happen if a certain condition was satisfied, even if it isn't in fact satisfied. So for example, um, it's true and in a sense it should be a law, right? That all brakeless trains would cause accidents. Right? Um, and so that's why we don't build brakeless trains. We hopefully we haven't built any and we haven't had to have those accidents. People don't have to die for us to know that, right? Um, so again, we the main point is we want to be able to make these counterfactual claims, these predictions about things that don't exist, um, and have those count as laws, right? Or as at the very least sort of being deducible from the laws. So again, if Regularity theory, since it's just bound to sort of descriptions of the world as it is, uh, it seems to rule out any of those sort, uh, that sort of reasoning about counterfactual. And even worse, um, any law of nature that has a continuous function, right? So basically almost anything um, that's in formulated mathematically, you could plug in any value. Um, there will be particular cases that have just happened to have never been instantiated, right? Since there is an infinite number of value, right? So, um, simple example, right? Force equals mass times acceleration, right? So I could, um, there's an infinite number of values that mass could take. So there's probably some value for mass that no object has ever had, right? Maybe 1.30276899945 and keep going until you find a very precise mass that no object has ever had, right? Um, well, that would mean that Newton's law does not apply to objects of that mass, right? Um, and that is just not how we think about these laws. Um, it's supposed to let us make predictions for things that would have that mass. That's one of the main points of having laws is you can make these predictions. Um, so you want to say that even though there's masses, velocities, so on, values that have not been instantiated yet, nature will apply to them, right? We're not carving out little holes in these laws, only talking about the, the mass and velocity that have been instantiated. Um, so again, we're having we have lots of problems about prediction with regularity theories because they're confining us to things that don't exist. Okay, so this was just a few, just to sort of give you a flavor of some of the objective regularity theory. Um, and in the next article by Dretzky, uh, really has a nice sort of, sort of unified review that kind of cuts, I think, to the heart of regularity theory and the problems of it, problems with it. And so all of these that I mentioned, you know, regular theor regularity theorists have tried to sort of go back and fix it up, add more conditions, and sort of account for these problems. Um, 
I think the next paper might be really sort of like off of the knees. You may disagree, right? You may um, still go with regularity theory, and um, that would be an interesting paper if you wanted to um, argue against Dresky. But I would take a look at the Dresky paper next, and, and I'll post a lecture on it.